800 billion pounds now, the government deficit at the beginning of COVID, which is 16 grand per adult. And somebody has to have it. It's an accounting fact. And I was there sort of screaming out, who has this 800 billion pounds? Can you tell me? Can you tell me? And there were politicians there from every party. Well, at least there was Conservative and Labour. And they looked at me and I knew immediately they didn't know who has the 800 billion pounds. They didn't know what the 800 billion pounds was. They didn't know they didn't know who had the 800 billion pounds. They didn't know they didn't know what the 800 billion pounds was. These guys are so clueless. They are beyond clueless. They are, they are so clueless that they are completely unable to recognize that they are clueless. So then you have this situation of, well, who the f do we listen to then? I first spoke to Gary Stevenson here on Downstream over a year ago. He came on for an interview in October 2022. Before we had even finished recording, in the room, I knew, our producers knew, that it was going to be a fantastic interview, that it would do extraordinarily well. We'd hit the jackpot. And that was because he was saying some really insightful things in a really unique way. And that's the word I use to describe Gary Stevenson. He is a unique voice. And he talks about the central issues of our time, but he offers some pretty unique prescriptions. And he has something for everyone, whether you're a young person struggling to get on the housing ladder, whether you're someone who doesn't quite understand why public services and high streets get worse every year, but whether you're an older person struggling to make ends meet, he can explain why things are getting worse and worse and worse. And it has something to do with inequality. As well as that, we knew during the interview he was working on a book. This book, The Trading Game. Don't worry, we won't be going over the same ground as before because frankly, it is one of the best books I've read in a number of years. It's a personal story about his time in trading, what he learned both personally and politically, and how it led him to some pretty remarkable conclusions. Dare I say, Gary Stevenson on inequality, the economy, and the future of what our society looks like is one of the most vital voices around. So it's my pleasure, again, to be joined by Gary Stevenson. Gary, welcome to Downstream. Thanks for having me back. I think it's the first time we've had a return guest. Okay. Uh, and that's because the last time we chatted, it was a runaway success. I think it's got about 800,000 views at this point. Um, and also, since then, you have written this. The Trading Game yeah. with Alan Lane. Penguin. We'll be talking about that. The stuff in the book is obviously an outgrowth of what we discussed previously. I just think it's pretty important to acknowledge how well that interview did. It's one of the things we've done here at Navarra Media where complete strangers came up to me afterwards for a few months, and not just in London, by the way, saying, I love that interview with Gary Stevenson. It was so clarifying with regards to stuff I hadn't previously understood. So thank you for that. That's all right. I mean, it was great for me as well. Because it's really brought a lot of attention to the work that I'm doing. So it's been really good. So just to, just to be clear for people who aren't familiar with you, you're a former trader. You have a YouTube channel um, about economics, um, finance. This new book, The Trading Game, um, we're going to just tread over old ground here. But briefly, you were a trader. Yeah. How did you become a trader? And how did you end up writing a book about being a trader? So this... This book is a story of how I went from being expelled from school at 16 um, in East London, right near Canary Wharf, to being Citibank's top trader in the world within 10 years. Uh, the title of the trading game is the name of basically a, a card game, a card game competition, which used to be run by Citibank in the early 2000s, through which they used to hire one trader a year. So I was studying maths and economics at LSE, London School of Economics. And some kid randomly said, there's a competition, maths competition, you should enter. Um, I entered and I won in 2006. And that meant that I was sort of there on the trading floor, knowing absolutely nothing about trading because I'd, all I've done is win some random card game. And um, it's great because it means I get to see it through these eyes of someone who knows nothing, which is great. So I can tell it to you through the eyes that I saw it of a 20-year-old kid who had no idea what he was doing, basically. 
Yeah. So you were at the LSE, everybody by second year, you know, you're a good student. Obviously, to do maths at the LSE, you have to be pretty smart. You're a good student. Um, but what's clear to you by the second year is everybody's just all, all of a sudden talking in acronyms and internships. And just to be clear, this is before the global financial crisis. So if you think in 2008, if you think lots of kids do that now, lots of young people do that now, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, it was, you know, a, a, an order of magnitude bigger than that. You then get sort of convinced to sort of play this game. And it's given you these new eyes to understand that industry. One thing you say in the book, which is fascinating, though, is you spend days working out how this game functions. Um, but also a major advantage for you is that the people you're playing against presume you're stupid. Mm. So quickly, the rules of this game. Yeah. How on earth does it work? Why is Citibank using a game to recruit traders potentially? Yeah. And what advantages did you personally have? So it's basically a betting game. So there's um, a set of cards, which the numbers one through 15, minus 10 and 20. So you get a card, I get a card. I think we used to play in tables of five. Everybody gets a card. And then there's three cards face down on the table. Um, and what we are doing basically is betting on what the sum of the cards will be. Our five cards in our hand and those three face down on the table. So if we've all got high cards, it'll be high. If we've all got low cards, it'll be low. If you're sitting on the minus 10, then you, you've got a good shout it's going to be low. So you want to bet that it's low. And um, we basically bet with one another the way financial markets work, which is using the system called two-way markets. So if you go to like the foreign exchange at Thomas Cook, you'll see they have like, we buy dollars, we sell dollars. This is how financial markets work. So if I think it's worth 75, I will say to you, I can buy at 74 or I can sell at 76. So I'm either off I'm offering to buy low or sell high and you have the choice. This is how financial markets work, basically. But, but at that time, I was 20 when I played this game, just turned 20. I had no idea. I was just treating it as a pure math game, basically. Um, but what is interesting, I think, is nowadays, if you study economics university, it's a very, very highly mathematized degree. You, you studied some economics, right? Some modules, but nothing. I didn't do an undergraduate or... Okay, so it's, but these, what should, I, not, I knew exactly straight away what an, an economic student would do, which is they would calculate this thing called the expected value, which is like just a, it's a statistical method, like exactly what is the sort of mathematical expectation. And then we'll just, they'll use their card. I've got a higher card, so I'm going to quote a bit higher. My expected value is 84, quote around 84. Someone else has got a low card, their expected value is 67, they'll quote around 67. And I knew straight away that is how, econo how economists think that's what they would do. But it's, it's actually a very stupid tactic because if you've got a low card and you're quoting 64, 66, and he's got a high card, then he's quoting 75, 77. I'm going to buy at 66. I'm going to sell at 75. And I'll just do that 25 times. And I've made like, an, basically, you could just make infinite profit. And um, it's, it's kind of amazing that it happened. Um, but I should probably add, and this is a detail in the book, one big advantage I had is that some guy, a random guy in the library, a guy from Grimsby, uh, what's his name, Luke Blackwood in the book, had come up to me and said, there's this game. I'm going to teach you the rules of the game. So one big advantage I had, which is sort of, I understand it now, I didn't understand at the time, which is that somebody had told me the rules of the game beforehand. Um, and I talk a little bit in the book about how that, that wasn't fair, you know. But I went to LSE, you went to UCL, didn't you? That's that right, right, yeah. yeah. So, My wife went to LSE. Okay. She was the... Trade union, trade union, the student union general secretary. Probably. Okay, good for her. Probably around, she probably... Okay, similar time point. maybe. Um, you don't need to spend long at LSE to realise that life is not fair. And that um, <laughs> a lot of people get given a lot of advantages that other people don't have. And, um, you know, I always explain the rules before the game. That's not fair. But God knows those other kids had a lot of rules explained to them in life that I didn't have. And they went on to become traders because their dads were traders, you know. My dad worked for the post office, so you take it where you can get it, I guess. I love this idea of a guy from Grimsby telling a person from East London in the LSE, you know, you're surrounded by the kids of Chinese, Chinese Communist Party, Politburo, Russian oligarchs, Arab sheikhs, and yet there's, there's kind, of, uh, it's kind of insider information uh, amongst people who aren't actually meant to be at the LSE, generally speaking. So there are multiple rounds to this game. <clears throat> what you've just described is really what gets you th through that first round. Yeah. And over time, obviously, you're coming up against more accomplished players, at which point psychology plays a greater role than, than merely working out probability and mathematical expectations. Yeah, so 
there was the first round at LSE and basically I just stormed that because you could just do this buy low, sell high, buy low, sell high. Nobody really could had figured out what was going on. They were just sort of, they were busy working out their expected values. It was super easy. But then there was a final which had students from Oxford, Cambridge, LSE, Durham, one other university. It's in the book. I can't remember. Warwick, that is it. Five universities. Um, but obviously all these guys had won their sort of previous rounds or been in the top five of the previous rounds. So they all sort of, you couldn't do this basic, just buy and sell, buy and sell. In fact, they kind of became the opposite. They knew you shouldn't be quoting different prices from everybody else. And what happens is you get this kind of clustering effect. It's like this, it's sort of the second level of understanding, which is don't quote different from everyone. So quote the same as everyone. And um, that is when this sort of, this idea that rich people kind of think kids that look and sound like me. I mean, you might think I look rough now. You should have seen me at 20. I was just, I was used to wear an echo track suit. It's all I used to wear echo track suit, you know, gelled up quiff. Um, and what I would do is, I would realize that because everybody wants to quote the same price as everybody else, you can, if you're basically loud enough, totally manipulate the price in every game. So I would, if I had the low card, I would come in right at the beginning and start really loudly quoting really high prices. And people just think, fuck, I better quote what that guy's quoting. So then I've actually got a low card. So what I want to do is sell, you establish a really high price and just sell to everyone at that price. And it's sort of, I think it's just, I think at both stages, you just got to be one step ahead of the guys around you, really. And um, I think this in the book, you know, this is a game. I think it's a nice way to introduce you to concepts of trading. But it holds like really true throughout my trading career, because later on, we talk about trading in financial markets. And I talk about this idea that to make money as a trader, it's not about being right. It's about being right when other people are wrong. It's saying the best trading, you do it with your nose. It smells like stupidity, basically. And I think to be a good trader really nowadays, it's kind of, ironically, it's the art of working out how posh people are thick because they're all posh, you know what I mean? And, you know, all communities have their sort of weird collective beliefs that are wrong. And, you know, the biggest one nowadays is posh people think that the economy is doing great. And um, I sort of started learning these lessons in the trading game when I was 20 years old. Yeah, the... the um... <clears throat> The explanation you've given for that and as to why you won is great. So no, it's, a, it's a blend, not just of mathematical knowledge, but also human psychology. The two together are what got you through that game and like you say, are, are what made you a great trader. You then go and work at Citibank. You get an internship, then you get a, a job. It all sounds very um, ad hoc, yeah. um, which is quite funny. You know, you're not being paid much initially. You don't really know. Yeah, I thought it was a ton. I was getting paid like 36 grand a year and I thought I was a millionaire. Yeah. But yeah. And before that, you were an intern on like thirty pound a day. Uh, no, I was. Even the interns were like thirty two grand a year. Pro rata. But and how yeah. long was the internship for? So I won a two week internship, and then you turn that into the ten week summer internship. Right. Yeah. So that was total twelve weeks of interns. Yeah. Pretty good money then for for somebody of your. I thought I was age. Yeah, yeah. I moved out of home for about three weeks and just became an alcoholic and spent it all. I, I had like seven grand, and I thought this is. You know, I was doing a paper round for twelve pound a week, and somebody gave me seven grand. I don't know how I spent it, but I managed to. And you used to fluff pillows at DFS, right? Fluff pillows at DFS for 40 pounds a day. Yeah, yeah. Well, they look good afterwards though. So you go to Citibank, you work on their Forex sort of operation. Yeah. Um, and at that time, Forex wasn't that glamorous, wasn't that sexy, or hadn't been. It wasn't somewhere you could make a ton of money, but actually you were right place, right time. Yeah, it was a funny one. So. Obviously, the euro got created early 2000s, all right? And what that meant was you have on a Forex desk, you have a trader for every currency and the number of currencies had massively collapsed, right? Especially we were on like the rich, rich world desk. So like the number of rich world currencies basically halved. Loads of people lost their jobs and it meant that they weren't hiring anyone. So, and at that same time, you'll remember, because I think you studied like similar time to me before 2008, these credit desks, everybody, like they were making fortunes. Everybody wanted to work on credit. Nobody wanted to work in FX. So um, I sort of, I interned one week on credit and one week on FX. And um, I was quite a popular intern for some reason. Everybody wanted me, but um, everybody thought this FX desk is really unpopular. But um, because they weren't, you got to understand the nature of the city changed massively between like the 90s and like the mid 2000s when I started. Like back in the 80s, 90s, 
there's this myth about the Cockney wide boy trader, right? And that used to be a real thing in the 80s and 90s. But by the early 2000s, it's these LSE types. You would have seen them at UCL, these kind of anonymous, wealthy, you don't know what country they're from, but they're definitely rich kind of people going in. The transnational capitalist class. Yeah, the, these kind of guys where like, you, you've got no idea where they're from, but you're sure they've got a good trust fund, basically. Mm. But on the FX desk, it was a bunch of like, older guys who sort of like stuck it out and basically younger guys who couldn't get a job on a better desk. And they were such a bunch of just nutters basically, but they had accents and they had attitudes and they, they were like straight away, we want this guy. And um, there's a character who I studied with at LSE called Matic. She was like, don't work on that desk. They're making no money. But the boss of that desk, a guy called Caleb, called me in and he said, if you work on our desk, we'll let you pick the day you start and we'll let you trade your own book, your own PL from day one. And for me, that was, that was all I needed. Because normally you go in, you do like a graduate scheme, two years, you rotate around. One thing you, you probably know from reading the book is I was a ridiculously competitive young man, very overconfident. So for me, they were like, if you're going to let me make my own bets straight away, then I'm in basically. So that's why I hired to the... FX Sturt Desk is what it's called in the book. Mm. Yeah, short-term interest rate trading. And this started to make a ton of money. Yeah. Not long after you you start, really. So prior yeah. to you joining, it was viewed as, like you say, all the money was in mortgage debt and credit and all this stuff. Yeah. But that changes very quickly. Yeah, so what we did on the Sturt Desk was we made extremely short-term loans, like literally one-day loans. And they're collateralized loans, which is you have to provide like the full amount of another currency. So they're very low risk, very short term loans, which is why it's like, it's no profit in it, right? No risk, no duration. It's not an exciting product. Nobody wants to work in it. I started working June 30th, 2008, which is obviously like three months before basically the world blows up, Lehman goes bankrupt. When Lehman goes bankrupt, suddenly nobody lends anybody any money except on the most safest circumstances. And the safest way you can lend some money is a, somebody money is a one day collateralized loan. So suddenly we were the only guys in the world making loans, basically. Every other person who was making loans couldn't make loans. So basically we were the only game in town. Not only that, but everybody needs US dollars. We're Citibank, we're the biggest US dollar bank in the world. And suddenly these guys who are kind of like the rejects, like the, the old men it's sitting in the corner of the trading floor making nothing. Suddenly, they are like, they're making like a million dollars a day, like each of them. And I had no idea what was going on, but they, they fucking loved it, obviously. I just want to pause the conversation there because actually Gary and us here at Navarra Media share something really important. His YouTube channel is brilliant. The link for it is in the description below. I really recommend subscribing. Like us here at Navarra Media, Gary is offering really valuable information to keep the public informed at no cost for free. And that's what we'll always do here at Navarra Media, to keep people informed, to make good decisions by reading our articles, by listening to our podcast, by watching our video. It will never, ever cost you a penny. But of course, making those things isn't free. And that's why we have supporters who agree with our mission of keeping the public informed and helping to make better decisions. And of course, Helping to create a better society. Democracy, a strong society, needs an informed citizenry. Uh, people that believe in that mission alongside us are our supporters. And if you want to join those supporters, why not go to navarramedia.com forward slash support. From one pound a month, you can help us do our work. I think it's critically important. Maybe you do as well. So if you agree with that, go to navarramedia.com forward slash support to keep this kind of conversation free out there and reaching an ever bigger audience. Because frankly, these are exactly the kinds of problems that affect all of us and will shape the course of the 21st century. And we wanna make sure as many people as possible are in receipt of the facts. So there's a freeze of interbank lending. Yeah. And the only way to access credit is through these basically mucking around with yeah, foreign exchange swaps, which are just super short term collateralized loans. And you were way. borrowing, you would be borrowing a certain amount of money in a currency for, say, three months, and then you would be lending it out on a daily basis. What would we, what we would do, I mean, at the time, to be honest, at that time, I'd only been there for three months. So I didn't, I was just sort of just scrabbling around, buying people's lunch, trying to get them to tell me what the fuck was going on. But um, 
we would lend the dollars out for three months and borrow them back one one day at a time. Right, right, right. And I because um, central banks guarantee like one day funding, so one day funding of dollars was quite cheap. So we would lend them out three months and borrow them back one day at a time, which it actually took me quite a long time. It took me about sort of about four or five months to figure out how the fuck everyone was making so much money. And this is sort of this this is sort of funny part of the book where like I turn up with this bunch of nutters. Suddenly everyone makes a ton of money and I'm just desperately trying to ask everybody, so um, how are you making all this money then? And then eventually I figured out that's what they were doing basically. They were lending out dollars, which I should add, is a kind of a proxy bet that the banking system is not going to collapse. So they're all betting the banking system's not going to collapse because if the banking system collapse, they're all going to lose their jobs anyway, aren't they? So they don't really care. And quickly, you said that obviously your Citibank, um, the number one US bank, right desk, right bank, can you explain why Citibank had dollars that nobody else had or had more dollars than other people had? I mean, it's, it's a massive commercial bank, isn't it? So they, they're the guys who have your bank account if you're just like, you know, some American Joe in Detroit somewhere working a job. That's where your bank account is, you know. These are ultimately, you know, there are other banks like Goldman Sachs, wherever. it's also an American bank, but they don't have a big commercial arm, you know. The big commercial banks, Citibank, JP Morgan, Bank of America, they're the guys that actually... At the end of the day, they're the guys that have the dollars. They have, well, not your dollars because you're not American, but for our American viewers, that's who they bank with. And you made 12 million pounds in your first year? 12 million dollars for the bank, for the bank in my first year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just to be clear, yeah. 12 minutes, you made 12 million dollars yeah. in your first year, yeah. broadly using the strategy of... Yeah, there's this funny scene in the book. The guy who hired me, Caleb, my first sort of boss, he quits after nine months to go like build his dream house in like the California countryside. And... um He's sort of, he's quite apologetic, like, I'm sorry, I didn't, you know, I hired you and I'm leaving. He says, I'll take you out and you can ask me any one question you like. And we went to Chili's, which is an American fast food chain, which is closed down. I used to be in Canary Wharf that does good buffalo wings. And I sat him down and I was like, what do I need to do to get paid 100 grand a year bonus first year? And he was like, there's no way you can do it. And I was like, just tell me. He says, you need to make $10 million for the bank. And by then I knew that basically all you need to do is like lend dollars and borrow them back and it's kind of easy money. But I was so junior, the way it works on the desk is every trader was allocated the currency. And at that time, all I had was New Zealand dollar, which is a shit currency. So you can't make any money on it. And I was like, I need to put one of these big trades on. And um, the boss left and he was a Swiss franc trader. And when he left, like... So this is Caleb. Caleb left. He was a Swiss franc trader. And um, there was no boss. So I was like sitting around on the desk doing all of like the admin stuff because I had to do it because there was no boss in the interim. This new boss came, comes over and he was this massive, enormous, about six foot seven Canadian guy. He just walked over to me. I didn't know he was going to be the new boss. All he did is he said to me, hey, how's it going? I was like, all right. And he pulled out a copy of Sports Illustrated, the swimsuit magazine. And he just starts like, just showing me these bikini models and just going like, yeah, you like that? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And it goes through the whole magazine one page at a time. And I'm slowly thinking like, this guy must be the new boss. And he's clearly completely insane. And then when he's finished, he says to me, so what's your job on the desk? And I'm thinking, like, I'm the desk junior, right? Like, he must know that, right? And I'm looking at him and he's looking at me. And I think, I just think, fuck it, let's give it a go. And I say to him, I'm the Swiss franc trader, Joe. And he's like, looks at me, I'm like, yeah, I'm the Swiss franc trader. And then he walks off. And then just like that, I've sort of become the Swiss franc trader, which is a massive book. Put this massive bet on. And by the end of the year, $12 million. But yeah, just like that. It's crazy. It doesn't, doesn't sound true, but it genuinely happened. So right desk, right bank, right change of boss, yeah, a bit right, of luck. right bullshit. I think a combination of luck and balls is probably the right way to describe it. Oh, you certainly made your own luck. So you'd asked Caleb, how can I make 100000 um Pound or dollar bonus? Uh, pounds. A hundred thousand pounds bonus what, is what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. Is what I was getting confused. So you you ask Caleb, how can I make a hundred thousand pounds? And you proceed to make how much for bonus off? So he goes, you need to make ten million dollars for the bank. Yeah. So I made twelve million dollars, you know, yeah. because you know you don't want to leave nothing to chance here. And then bonus day comes, and obviously I'm thinking, well, I'm going to get paid one hundred twenty grand. You know, ten million dollars, hundred grand, twelve million dollars, hundred twenty grand. Um. And I'm feeling like pretty good for myself, you know, 120 grand, a lot of fucking money. I come from a very poor background. Um, I go into the room and it's this massive guy, Chuck, this enormous guy just sitting there and he's got the piece of paper on the table. 
and um, I'm looking at the piece of paper and I'm looking for like 120 grand. And there's, there's like a load of numbers there, but this doesn't say 120 grand. Um, so I'm a bit confused. The top number says 395,000. And I just like, is it that number? And he just starts laughing. He's like, I re and I, re I remember this, like when you're writing a book, you kind of have to sort of patch me. But I remember this like it was yesterday. I remember he starts laughing and I said, word for word, I said, wow, that's a lot of money. That's exactly what, and I, I was, it's a big moment in the book and it's a big moment in my life, I think. Um, and uh, the next thing I remember, I'm back on the desk. It's this, it's this absurd memory, but I'm sitting on the desk and I'm next to this guy, Billy, who become like a sort of big like mentor of mine. And I feel like I'm going to start crying on the desk. And this guy, Billy, comes around to the other side of me. So the other traders can't see me. And um, he's like, just go outside and have a sit down. Yeah. And I think that, I've read the book like 10 times, got to do the edits. I describe it in the book as I think that was when something inside me changed on that day, basically. Because you, um, if I'd have made 120 grand, I would have gone home. I would have told my mum. I would have told my girlfriend. I would have told my mates. Made 120 grand, I've gone to the pub, bought everyone a drink. But you make 395 grand. You come from where I'm from and you see how much, you know, my dad works 20 grand a year, worked his fucking tits off, 20 grand a year. You know what I mean? Not just my dad, everybody's dad. And um, 120 grand feels like well done. 400 grand, it kind of felt criminal. You know what I mean? And even, even your friends who were in the financial services industry at that time, you're sort of playing PlayStation. Yeah. You talk about this, even they're sort of saying, oh, they've got their bonuses off oh, five grand, 10 grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even those guys who've done really well, you know, they've, they've done the whole social mobility thing or whatever. Yeah. You're smashing them out of the park. What? Well, this is kind of what you think happens, right? You go in there and you, you think you're going to make 50, 60, 70. That's what I thought. That's what I thought it was. And that's what my mates were doing, you know, first couple of years. You know, we graduated like just before Lehman. So a lot of people, you know, weren't expecting to make tons of money. Um, and there's this one... Yeah, there's this one scene just after um, I've received that bonus. First, there's me telling my girlfriend. And then I see the effect there and I'm like, that's it. I'm not telling anyone. And then I go to my mate's house. And, you know, we, that was uh, beginning of 2010. So I'm literally 23. And, you know, we're playing Pro Evo in my mate's bedroom. That's what we do. We're 23, you know what I mean? We're all living with our mums, right? And, um... We're all just like, they're all just like, what did you make? What did you make? Oh, I made five grand. Oh, I didn't make anything. And then one of them says, what did you And I, I was just like thinking, I hope they just don't fucking ask me. And then one of them's like, what did you make? And there's kind of this moment where you think like, I decided I wasn't going to tell anyone. But these are my mates. Like, I've known these guys most of my life. Like, do you hide it from your mates or do you not? And I just decided in the moment, I'm just going to tell them. So I was like, yeah, I made 395 grand. And you just kind of you feel the oxygen like suck out of the room and you just, all of your mates are just like, what the fuck? And I think I said in the book, nothing was the same after that. And I think, and I think there's a degree to which, to which that is true. So you said that when you went outside, that was the moment everything changed. You then quickly said your girlfriend, when you told her how much the bonus was, what was her reaction? So obviously I was like quite pumped at making this hundred grand, right? And I was like, Telling my girlfriend at the time, like, you know, I'm going to make a load of money bonus day. And she was very sensible. Listen, it's all right. You don't have to tell me what it is. It's going to be very, you know, supportive. And then um, after that, when I made that 395 grand, I had a plan to go see her, but I didn't want to go home. So I messaged her, like, can I come around yours tonight? She used to live out in Kilburn. So I took the Jubilee line out to Kilburn where she lived in Canary Wharf. And um, I stayed, I was there with her. And I was just like, I just was just like dumbstruck. And I, I remember she'd said, you don't have to tell me. And I was just like not saying, I was just like, I remember like, she used to draw, probably can't say which brand. She used to hand draw t-shirt designs for like a major brand. She had all of these like hand drawn like deer skeletons and like, I don't know, horse skeletons all around her. And I just remember just lying on it. She had a tiny little flat in Kilburn. She's like an art student, you know. And I didn't say nothing. And then... In the morning, in the middle of the night, I woke up and she was crying. Like, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? And I, I think I was still, in, in, looking now in hindsight, I think I was in shock, basically. And I told her it was this amount. And I just saw 
the shock which I had felt in her face. I saw her face change because ordinary people, we're 20, what, 23 years old, right? That 400, you don't think about these kinds of amounts of money. And it's just sort of like, you're there. She was You're living, ecstatic if you're not in your, in your she overdraft. She was living in this tiny little flat. She, it was winter. You get paid your bonus in January. She had one of them little ro rotating heaters. She wouldn't use the, the heating, wouldn't turn the heating on in the winter. You know what I mean? And we're there in this flat. And I'm telling her I've made this amount of money. And I just saw her face. And that's when I thought like, this is it. You just can't. And I didn't tell any, after the, these two people I told, I didn't tell anyone for maybe it was 10 years before I ever said to anyone that amount. I said it in a New Statesman interview, like maybe a couple of years ago. Between that, those two, those two times to tell anyone, I didn't tell anyone. And you broke up with your girlfriend soon afterwards? Yeah, soon afterwards. So if you don't mind me asking, how, how did that work? Did she finish it? Did you finish it? What happened? I finished it. I mean, she was studying like for a fashion degree and she was like, big final year fashion degree, working really hard. I think she, I was young. She was young. I think she just, we were both going through a lot and um, she was kind of fucking her studies up basically. And I remember thinking like, I blamed myself. I was like, I need to get out of this relationship because otherwise she needs to focus on her stuff. But I think to be honest, like there's a degree to which I was sort of, there's this moment. I think it's, it's one of my favorite scenes in the book where I'm, there's a little uh, grass, a little square of grass in Canary Wharf in between the three big skyscrapers in the middle. And I went and sat out there after I made this bonus. And my first thing I thought of was my, my dad. Yeah. And when I was a kid, my dad used to take the train really early in the morning and the train used to run right past my house. And my mum would wake me up and we'd try and wave at my dad on the train. It's like a memory I have. And then my dad would come back, what in my mind was super late. So we, we, we felt like we never saw him. He was always working, always tired for 20 grand a year, you know? And I remember the kids I grew up with, a kid, Ibran Khan, right? Where I went to school, it was a very Pakistani area, lots of like Pakistani kids. And I'd go around their houses, they're all like really nice to me. This guy, Ibran Khan, his dad was disabled and he used to sleep on a sofa downstairs. And you just think of all of these people, how hard, how fucking hard they work for nothing. And then a kid like me, is making 400 grand. But then the next thing you think is, well, if I made 400 grand, 23 years old, what the fuck did that guy make? What the fuck did that guy make? What did those guys over there make? And then there's this kind of like battle in my mind between compassion, in a sense, selfishness, and also this kind of sense of warped justice, which is, well, fuck it. If those fucking credit dickheads in the pink shirts can make fucking, they must be making millions a year. You know, if they're going to do it, I'm going to do it for fucking Ibrahim Khan and for my dad. That's what you tell yourself. But the, I think this one of the big sort of games in the book is, was it, you know, the, the dedication of the book is like, this is for all the, the cold kids and the hungry kids. I did it for you. No, I did it for me, so I did it for you. So it's, and it's like, this is a question I ask myself, is questions about greed is, you know, when I was a kid, I told myself I was doing it for kids like me, but maybe I was just doing it for me, you know? That's the big question, I guess. So before you got that £395,000, you said it changed after that. Were you a happy person before then? What, were your, what, what, was, the, what was the quintessence of Gary Stevenson? What was your character? Coming we, in with the big questions. Well, I want to know how yeah. you changed. So what were you like before that? I was a very competitive kid. So I grew up in Ilford. Ilford is, it's, it's an immigrant area, basically. Schools I went to were 90% immigrant families. My mum's family is an immigrant family, right? And um, a lot of them have been in poverty very recently if they're not in poverty now. And, uh, you know, we fucking get rich or die trying. That's what I was raised with, you know. Uh, you, you grew up in Bournemouth, is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. So I don't know, but uh, like, you know, it was a hard life. I didn't come from the best family. And I, put, I, went to, I got to grammar school. And then in grammar school, I was like the smart poor kid in the grammar school. And then that, that makes you hungry. You know what I mean? Because... You're getting judged, but you know, like I'm fucking better than these guys. I'm fucking smarter than these guys. So um, I was just fucking competitive. I was that guy who's like, you know, who's doing like 200 press ups and a thousand sit ups a night, and who's you give me a competition, I want to win it. Just a, in a way, it's a typical boy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just a, but where did that come from? 
Do you get that from your mum, from your dad? I think probably what it is is. I, I was always very smart as a kid. And then you you go into these schools where you're the poorest kid in the school. And, you know, we live in this culture that tells you if you're rich, it's because you're fucking good. And if you're poor, it's because you're fucking shit, right? And I, I remember, like, when we turn, like, 16, everybody gets a car. And everybody's like, oh, have you seen Raj's new car? He must be doing really well for himself. And I'm thinking, like, he's fucking 16. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, what the fuck do you think? And you... You get, I, I think it's, it's funny, looking back now, I can sort of say when I was a kid, I thought I wanted to get rich. But then, you know, the journey of the book kind of, as I start to make money, you see, I don't fucking spend anything. I don't spend any money. I don't, what I realise now is I'm actually not a particularly materialistic person. Looking back in hindsight, I was just fucking sick of being poor and being fucking looked down on. And I tell you now, there'll be people out there who've grown up poor will fucking understand that. I think it's just, you know, it's shit being poor. It's fucking hard. Yeah, this is something that really is obvious to me over the course of the, the book. The only, the only time I think, oh wow, he's spending money here, is when you're in Japan and you're eating out every night. Mm. But other than that, you're you're a very frugal person, and you're not really spending on anything. If you don't mind me saying, you know, you're just wearing a t-shirt. You cycled here. You're not somebody who's spending loads of cash on stuff. And it's interesting to understand where that came from—a sense of insecurity, not inadequacy, but a feeling of being looked down on by others. But then you go into the belly of the beast, where that is like that is the engine driving all of this, which is you know financial services. You make a lot more money after that, so it's not just this this one year of this one bonus. You make lots of money after that. What was your strategy for making so much money? Because within a couple of years, you're one of the biggest traders for City, maybe the biggest. You're up there, yeah. you know, the one percent. So how did you do that? So it's funny, right? In my first year, I made this 12 million for the bank. And, um, you know, I like to think of myself as a smart guy. You might think like, oh, he's done that because he's really smart. But like, I had no, I was just copying the guys around me. I really didn't really know. It was just blind copying. I think this is kind of, in a sense, this is a journey of anyone who wants to sort of master a craft. You come in, you don't know what you're doing. You find some people who are good at it, you copy them. And I was just copying. There was one guy on the desk called Billy who was a scouser. He was already in his mid forties by the time I started working on the bank. Didn't go to university, worked his way up from being on the cash desk at Halifax. And I fucking love this guy, like straight up. Like one of the first things I see him do is, one of the earliest, I go in there and he's like sitting on the desk and some like, some salesman like playing some music. And he goes around like, can you turn the music down? I'm trying to work it. You know, I turn it down. They turn it up again. He goes around, can you fucking turn the music down? I'm trying to work it, goes back. They turn it up again and he, um, we were like, Say we're both working, there's like all these sets of screens in between us. He pulled the wires from their speakers underneath their screens, just took a pair of scissors and just snipped them and fucking turned the speakers off like that. And I was like, this is the fucking guy who's going to teach me, basically. And he was, everybody looked down on this guy and he fucking hated everyone. And then suddenly in 2008, he made $100 million because he'd been betting for years the global economy was going to blow up. And I was like, fucking this guy, I need to learn to trade from this guy, basically. So I was just trying to fucking copy this guy, copy other traders. And then in my second year, 2010, this mad thing happens. And the Swiss National Bank suddenly effectively cut their interest rates to four and a half percent. And in a week, I lose eight million dollars. And that's 2010. So I would have been still 23, right? Fucking young. And I've lost eight million dollars in a week, right? And uh, there's this one scene in the book. At that time, I wasn't living at home anymore. I was living with a mate of mine from Ilford. And he'd invited all my mates around. And we're just drink they're drinking beers and like eating pizzas, playing fucking Pro Evo. And I'm just sitting there thinking, I've just lost eight fucking million dollars. And that meant that my yearly p and at that point went to minus four million dollars. And you're thinking like, am I going to Your P&L lose? is basically your, yeah, so like your a profit and loss. Like yeah, a yeah, current account. Exactly. It's, you know, 23-year-old you know, kids should not be four million dollars down, basically. And I'm thinking, am I going to fucking lose my job? And um, I did what every good former LSE student does. I started come bringing my textbooks into the office. It's, it's, it seems funny now, but you know, I was economics fucking, you know, student. I, st I studied economics at LSE, right? So, and I start reading up on like what's happening on the desk. And this guy, Billy, who I'm sitting next to, never went to university. Fucking, fucking good trader. He lets me do it for one day. He lets me do it two days. Third day, he just comes in, slaps the fucking textbook out of my hand into the bin. And he goes, what the fuck are you doing, you fucking brick? Does this look like fucking Jack Nori to you? 
And I'm like, fuck, you know, he goes, listen, you're not a fucking kid anymore. Yeah. If you want to understand how the economy works, you're not going to read it in fucking textbooks. If you want to know how the economy works, go talk to your mum and ask her what her financial situation is like. Go talk to your friends, talk to your friends' mums. Look at the adverts on a tube. Walk down the fucking high street. Look at what shops are closing down, what's opening up. Look at the homeless people. Is there more? Is there less? That's the economy is the fucking real world, basically. And this, I think I describe it in the book as the most important thing I ever heard, basically, because I've been to university and nowadays every top trader, every trader at a big bank has got an elite degree from elite university. And the truth is, these guys, that's not how they think. They don't understand. They don't even know any ordinary people. They, they went to elite universities, elite schools before that. They're from rich families. And this guy planted that seed for me, which is, I realized then I had the massive advantage over these guys, which is I fucking knew ordinary people. And by that stage, middle, second half of 2010, we'd seen two years in which everybody said we're going to have a massive recovery, which never happened. So I was thinking, if I can figure out why this recovery is not happening, these bunch of posh boys, I've got no fucking clue. That, that is where the money is. And I, that is when I became basically obsessed with the economy. I think until then, I was just kind of fucking around trying to make money. But that is when, you know, nowadays, economic students don't care about the economy. That sounds crazy. But economic students pick economics because economics is a raffle ticket for a banking job. And everyone at LSE knows that. We don't give a fuck about economics. We take economics to get jobs to make money. And that, that is the gap. That is the gap. If you want, because those guys in the skyscrapers, they don't have a fucking clue what's happening and they're wrong every year. That, and that, that is how I eventually started to make a lot of money. Because you loved economics. And you were immersed in this world of the real I, economy. Yeah, and I knew that economics is people. So I, start, I went out and I started asking people. And the big question after 2008 was, why has there not been a recovery? Why are people not spending money? I just went out and fucking asked people, why are you not spending money? You know, if, do it. Ask people. You know, obviously ask people that you know well. They'll all say the same thing. I don't spend money because I don't have any fucking money. And it's the truth. You know, you, you, you dig into the finances of ordinary families. At the time I was in my early to mid twenties and what I saw around me was kids who will never own houses with parents who own houses. So these are families that are losing their wealth. And this was like early 2011, same thing was happening for governments. Governments, which is happening now by the way, governments going bankrupt, going into debt, losing their assets. Families going bankrupt, going into debt, losing their assets. And what really, I think the two things which I caught were number one, this really interesting like symmetry between the situation of governments and the situation of ordinary families. Both cases, spending more than their income, losing their assets, going into debt. And secondly, that this is impossible. It's not possible, right? It's not possible for every person, every family to lose their assets and go into debt and governments to lose their assets and go into debt, right? All the debt is to somebody that has to balance out and the houses are not fucking disappearing. So who owns them? And there's this moment sort of sitting on the desk. At the time I used to go to this one meeting because when I was a junior, I used to have to carry the sandwiches to the meeting. And when this new boss came in, who I told I was a Swiss trader, I just never told him about the meeting. And I kept going, kept bringing it because I thought it might be useful. And I came back in that meeting one day, they said, basically, every major government in the world is effectively bankrupt. I came back from the meeting with all these bags of sandwiches. I'm thinking, OK, so all the people are bankrupt. All the governments are bankrupt. So who's got the fucking money then? And obviously, I'm sitting on this desk surrounded by fucking millionaires, right? And that was like the penny drop moment for me where you're like, this is it, this is it, this is what's happening, isn't it? It's, we're losing the middle, the middle class losing their homes, government's going bankrupt and it's going to the rich and then, and that's not going to stop, is it? That's only going to keep going. So here you go, collapse forever. That's the bet. You, you, you use that line, you say that the economy will get worse forever. Hmm. I mean, what does that mean? Is there no possibility of the middle class expanding again in so I much mean, as... Listen, if we're lucky, they'll, they'll, they'll discover nuclear fusion tomorrow. We'll have free energy and, you know... Well, forget, yeah, forget the technology. But I mean, in terms of just with regards to our economic model, if everything else stays stable, yeah. there isn't a global war, there isn't, you know... Yeah. 
somebody discovers the 21st century version of the printing press. Look, I think this is the question, right? If families can't run expenditure less than income when they own their own home and when the government is not bankrupt, so it's paying for some of their services, are those families going to be able to run balanced budget when they don't own their own home and when the government is not providing free education? You know, university costs nine grand a year. Now you've got to pay rent every month. You know, if, if families are on a downward trajectory, they're losing their assets. So when they have assets, they're losing them. Well, is life more expensive when you have assets or when you fucking don't? So if the middle class suddenly doesn't have its assets, it's more debt, more indebted. It has to pay more rent. It has to pay more interest. Government has to pay more rent. The government has to pay more interest. It doesn't get better, right? It's like we're playing chess, right? And I'm losing. You take six of my pieces. What are my chances fucking now? You know, if you, if you lose, if you're, if you're losing with assets, what are your chances fucking without assets? You know, and then at the same time, the rich are accumulating assets, which means they're getting more and more passive income. What are they going to do with the passive income? They're going to buy the fucking rest of the assets. You know, at the end of the day, it's about dynamics of power. You know, if you're in a situation where one group has the power and is using the power to take the rest of the power, then you're 10 years later, you've got all the power now, I've got none of the power. Well, I was losing even when I had some of the power. You know, it's, just, it's about understanding systems and power. You know, if, if you're losing already and you're losing your power, then you're going to lose forever, right? Until you've got nothing left and then you end up in a situation, you know. I think if you want to see the future, go to places that are very unequal. Go to India, you know. Go to Brazil, go to South Africa, go to Colombia, go to these really unequal places. Because, and I think what people need to recognise is that can happen here. That could be the future of Europe. South Africa, I don't India, think it, Brazil. I think it will be. I think it, and I, I don't just... How quickly? So, you know, I was talking about this stuff back in 2014, 2015, when I started trying to work on this stuff. And um, I spent a long time trying to publicize this stuff, not, not publicly. I went back to Oxford, I did a two year masters. I made a website, I volunteered at New Economics Foundation. Um, there are probably people out there that think, oh, this guy, he's got a fucking YouTube with his face and his name all over it. He just a wanker wants to be famous. I didn't do anything publicly until COVID, nothing publicly. And I'll tell you why I went public during COVID. Because at the beginning of COVID, I knew immediately this is going to cause the biggest and fastest ever increase in inequality. And what was a slow grind towards broad poverty is going to become a fucking rapid march towards poverty. And people don't, at the beginning of COVID, nobody knew that. People were talking about fucking roaring 20s, weren't they, right? So I was like, well, I'm going to fucking tell them. I'm going to fucking tell them. Um, so I think it would have taken a while, but COVID has jumped us 10, 15 years forward. I mean, poverty has fucking exploded in this country. And I don't, you know, that, what that means is people are losing their assets, you know, and you're seeing it in front of your eyes, right? What, what chance have young people got of buying houses now? So it's quicker now. And I think in the next 10 years, things will get significantly worse. It's interesting for me because I bought a house with my wife a couple of years ago and each side of us is an HMO. And it goes to your point about the real economy. And in, that, in the HMO, either side of us, uh, six seven flats mm -hmm. and that would have just been a home previously for yeah. you know a couple of parents a couple of kids and on the one hand we need more dense cities because yeah. obviously you know we have to house people i totally get that but on the other hand this is really a machine to extract wealth and to ramp up inequality that's what hmos are with with regards to landlords and and the dynamics of rentierism so for me it's it's perfectly obvious yeah. and it makes me incredibly grateful i think anybody with the assets in the context you're talking about, should be very grateful. But it should also be obvious to lots of people in, in finance and politics and media, surely. Yeah. But the dynamic you're talking about, so since, since the early 80s, and obviously it's really going into overdrive now, the state used to have lots of assets. Now it has very few assets. It not only has fewer assets, it also has much higher De debts. Yeah. The banks have much higher debts. Consumer debt is much higher than it used to be. Mm -hmm. We have lots of student debt. So we have fewer assets, more debts, everybody, public and private. And like you say, somebody has to be the beneficiary of that. Yeah. And this is clearly intensifying over time. But this, this doesn't seem obvious to the majority of people who make political decisions yeah. in this country. It's coming from the economists. It's coming from the economists. It's coming from the universities. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned this thing about that HMOs around you because um, I grew up in Ilford. It was always a very poor street. Railway right behind us, you know, factory recycling center, pending. 
But when I grew up, it was kind of respectable, poor families, right? You go there now, all those houses extended back, extended up, rented up by the room to extremely impoverished people. Um, there's a massive block of flats on the end of the street where the factory was, rented out to extremely impoverished people. And um, I think a lot of people don't, I think people talk about, we need more housing in London, we need more housing in London. I'm not saying we don't. Go to where I've grew up. It's a fucking slum now. Yeah. It's fucking poverty everywhere. Yeah. It's a fucking slum there. People live hard lives. And it wasn't easy when we grew up. But it's much harder now. Yeah. Um, so I think people need to be aware of that. Um, but the reason that these guys don't recognise it, it's coming at, at the heart of it from the universities. And when you study economics... First thing I will say, economics is a difficult degree. It's not easy, right? It's not complicated, but it's not easy, right? You have to memorize a fuck ton of algebra. Um, the models themselves, they're not conceptually difficult, but you have to memorize a lot of difficult algebra, calculus, you know, matrices. The memorization is complicated, right? If you become senior enough to be influential in economics, you've done three-year undergrad, you've probably done five years postgrad, maybe more, right? So you've spent fucking 10 years of your life memorizing this algebra, right? All of those models are what are called representative agent models, which means rather than looking at a broad mass of whatever, lots and lots of people, one of the simplifications they make, mathematical simplification is to say, well, let's assume it was only one average person. We're going to look at just the average person. As soon as you do that, you're assuming all inequality out of the model. So if you are a, a prestigious macroeconomist nowadays, you have by definition spent 10 years memorizing a fuck ton of algebra about a complicated model that has no inequality and no distribution. This is what, this is what these people are, okay? When something happens in the economy, you spent 10 fucking years memorizing algebra of these models with no inequality. Are you going to be like, maybe it's this thing which I've never even fucking looked at. You know what I mean? And, you know, okay, I, I, I've had a lot of success as a trader. I made a lot of money when I was a trader. I've made a lot of money trading since I quit professional trading. Um, realistically, all the money I've made is from one simple understanding. Inequality matters and the economists haven't fucking realised. That's, that's why, it's, if you understand that, you can predict the economy much fucking better than these guys. I mean, at the beginning of COVID, US government has given out $10 trillion. That's the total US government deficit since the beginning of COVID. $80,000 per US taxpayer. Nobody even stopped to fucking ask who's going to accumulate that money. This is the extent to which they don't realise that distribution matters. And it's a massive fucking blind spot. A massive fucking blind spot. And that's why their predictions are continuously wrong. And that's why I make a fucking ton of money every fucking year betting on it. Because you're right when others are wrong. Really, because you only need... If you have one massive flaw in your theory, all I need to do is know that flaw because then I'll know exactly the way in which your predictions will be wrong. You haven't looked at the inequality. Okay, inequality increased massively during COVID, massively, enormously during COVID. So then we know, okay, well, these guys will get a fucking ton of money. These guys won't get a ton of money. That's going to dominate the economy going forward. Then, you know, I think during COVID, everybody said we're going to have roaring 20s, really strong economy. Now, after COVID, everybody's saying we've got a shit economy. In reality, both things happened. Go to the fucking luxury restaurants in London. They are fucking booked fucking out. You know, the luxury economy has never been... Every single fucking luxury brand is at record all-time highs, stock price. So really, the economy is not good since COVID. The economy is not bad since COVID. It's fucking fantastic if you're rich and fucking terrible if you're not. But if you understood that we massively increased inequality during COVID, you could have predicted that. And I fucking did predict it. People who don't believe that can go and watch my fucking first video on my YouTube channel from June 2020 when I predicted that would happen because if your understanding is wrong, your predictions are wrong. And the main thing that they're missing is that inequality and distribution matter. Yeah, the point about it being a, a very good period for the elite, the wealthy. Last year, you had um, a quote from the managing director of Harrods. I'll never forget it. They said, in a recession, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. We're doing fine. At the exact same time, um, LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Moet, Hennessy, this luxury super brand, um, became Europe's most valuable company by market capitalization. 
This should be telling you something. If in Europe, a continent of 450 million people, the most valuable company is selling luxury brandy and handbags increasingly to um, Asians, some to Americans, some to Europeans too. This should probably tell you something, but it doesn't. Um, and you were talking about people haven't quite realized yet. We've talked about the problem coming from economists. We'll go back to economics as a profession, economics professors. You have this obsession with this former professor who had a snakeskin belt. Yeah. I want to know more about that. But in the here and now, you know, we're a few months out probably from a general election in this country. Um, and we've got a budget coming up in March. And Jeremy Hunt found out recently that actually we've got a bit more money than we thought, even though we're still running a deficit, because uh, UK gilts are slightly healthier. So the interest payments are slightly lower than we thought. So we've probably got an extra five, six billion that we didn't account for. The deficit is smaller than it was projected to be. Now, the Tories being the Tories are saying, well, well, we'll give tax cuts, income tax cuts. Everybody likes income tax cuts, but the point is they accrue to the wealthy. So the wealthy love them as well. From what you're saying to me, that's a really stupid thing to do. To give a tax cut to the rich, when we have all these dynamics in play, just means they'll spend more of that money on assets. It'll continue to drive the inequality. The poor will have to pay more rents to the rich, so it's like this Ouroboros, this, this snake that's swallowing its own tail. And it's almost like the prevailing political orthodoxy, to wit Jeremy Hunt, is to actually, you know, let's ram the tail into the snake's yeah. mouth even more. But the thing is, you've got to realise, the economists don't realise this. Because the, the, the problem with um, a crisis of inequality is, it looks great from the top. And who the fuck has a voice who's not at the top? I did an interview with... Um, an American podcast the other day, listen, he was like, well, the economy's great, isn't it? The economy's great, you know, and, but there's this, um, he used this term, which a lot of people use at the moment, which is, well, I turned around to him and said, listen, I don't know what you're worth. I don't know what you make. If we brought the guy in here off the street, average income, average wealth, and asked him, is the economy great? What do you think he would say? And he was like, well, it's true. The vibes are off. It's true. The vibes are off. And well, the I, vibes, vibes don't pay the bill, the mate. The Economist won an article this week. The, why the vibes off? And, um, Listen, these guys, inequality <laughs> is great for the rich. And also, all of the statistics these guys look at are looking at the averages. They're looking at the averages. You know, higher inequality, you're fucked. You don't have any house. What do you have to do? You have to fucking work harder, don't you? You have to fucking work harder. Well, that's fucking good for the economy. You know, fucking slavery is good for the economy. If you make everybody work their tits off because they're fucking impoverished, well, you know, then you'll produce a lot of shit, won't you? You know what I mean? Um, they only look at averages. They only look at averages and, you know, I get people message me on my YouTube sometimes saying, listen, why don't you go into politics? The way I see it is I'm in fucking politics because those guys are not going to fix it. Jeremy Hunt is fucking worth, I don't know, fucking 10 million, 20 million quid. Richard Sunak's worth 700 million quid, right? David Cameron left office and made 10 million pounds in his first year, right? These guys are not going to fix it. Right? I've seen The Economist. They're not going to fix it. The reason I have a YouTube which explains economics in a way that is understandable and welcoming and accessible to ordinary people is because they're the guys who are being fucked. The guys who are supposed to protect them will not protect them and they have to protect themselves because nobody else will. So that's why I target them and try and talk to them. You know, I did a TED talk a few years ago and doing that really brought home the exact dynamics you're talking about because of course there's two aspects here. The first is there's just a lot more money in North America, like a lot more. It's a huge market, you know, US, five, six times our population, plus Canada, plus it's just per capita wealthier. Um, I was in Vancouver and it was incredible to be in this amazing five-star hotel. The suite was, you know, ridiculous. Um, having nice dinners with, you know, really clever people. Thank you for having me on, by the way. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Lovely people. And then I got talking to this lovely lady who was helping with me with my speech. And she said, oh, we're spending X amount of money on this project. And she said, yeah, we're spending eight. And I thought she was going to say $8 million. She said, we're spending $800 million. Okay. So it's basically like something which Ted is collaborating with, yeah. but it's primarily money from, you know, the ultra yeah. people like Bill Gates and whatnot to work on X, Y, Z problems. $800 million. And then in Vancouver, same city, you go to the downtown if you think Skid Row is bad, yeah, incredible. Because it's obviously a warm part of Canada. So anybody who's rough sleeping, a drug addict, yeah. goes to British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Vancouver's the largest city. This is where they converge. I went with my wife. We walked down this street. 
a thousand fifteen hundred drug addicts on opioids. Yeah, yeah. And and then two miles away, you have people doing a bidding war to give millions of dollars to Ukraine for social status amongst their friends. Mm -hmm. You have extraordinary wealth. And then in the middle of it, Bill Gates is going to talk about vaccines. And you have people outside saying that, you know, Bill Gates is trying to put, you know, 5G nanotechnology in our body or whatever. And you think, here's the fucking problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like you say, the inequality, the addiction, all of the, the, the downsides of massively unequal societies. Uh, the poverty, the extraordinary wealth, and you're talking about fucking 5G masts. Yeah. Um, and that's where somebody like you comes in to make those explanations stick because people know something is deeply wrong, Yeah. but without the quote-unquote thought leaders to make sense of it in a proper way, we end up with crazy conspiracy theories. However, you are in politics, but politicians still need to listen to you. Yeah. And my worry is we can win the debates. You know, the left has been talking about, not even the left, People with common sense have been talking about this issue for 10, 15 years. Uh, and we're not, well, we are winning the debate, but it's January 2024 and Jeremy Hunt's still doing the exact same thing. Yeah. You know, he's doing the exact same thing he would have done in June 2010. Yeah. 14 years later. Yeah. Yeah. So, what has to happen for these people to understand this relationship between the billionaires talking in the Vancouver Conference Center? and the 1,500 drug addicts sitting on the streets of downtown Vancouver. What has to happen for them to realize the relationship between these two things and how the economic imperatives they believe in are making this worse, not better? I'll tell you what, it's difficult. And the reason I say that is, I am a person, I, I became a millionaire in 2011 by betting on the collapse of the global economy. And then, you know, I basically made another million the next year by betting on the same thing. And I've been betting on that year after year after year. Um, And I think I'm right. I think I'm right. Um, It's not easy to make as much money as I've made when you come from where I'm from by having a theory that's fucking wrong. Um, And that means that I'm confident this gets worse. Um, Seriously worse. And I carry that around with me every day. Every day. And people ask me, what do you think is going to happen? And there's times when I think, maybe I just shouldn't tell them. Because it can get a lot worse than what it is now. A lot worse than what it is now. And those people you see, you know, the homeless, the drug addicts, they're the tip of the iceberg, you know. And I don't want to at all sound unsympathetic to those people. But for every one guy out on the street, there's fucking 20, 25 people who are not far away from that in terms of financial situation, in terms of mental health. Um... So my message, which I'm delivering, is not a pleasant one to receive and it's not a pleasant one to deliver, which is that if we don't change this system of increasing inequality, it gets much worse, much worse, much more poverty, much more positive, poverty, poverty for your kids, for your grandkids, serious poverty, you know. You know, go to India, go to Mumbai and look, you don't need to fucking look fucking far. You know, you've seen it in Vancouver, you know, it can, you know, it can be really, really worse. Um, but if people understand that, they, they will demand change. They will. Because people don't realize that. What people are told is this is a recession. A recession means a couple of bad years, tighten your belts, you know, sharpen up. Things will be all right. Things won't be all right. Things won't be all right. They're not going to be all right. They're going to get worse and worse, really seriously worse. And I don't just say that. I fucking bet on it. I'm betting on it now. I make a ton of fucking money. And I've been fucking right for a long fucking time. All right. Um, it's not a good message, it's not a positive message, it's not a nice message, but if enough people understand that, they will demand change. And you're already seeing, you know, more and more people are starting to clock on that what's happening is not working. It's not gonna work for them, it's not gonna work for the kids, and they are demanding change. And um, people are not idiots. People can see that their kids are living lives that are much worse than their lives. Um, there will be change. There will be change. Look at, look at the trends in politics, there will be change. There will be change. Doesn't have to be good change, but there will be change. And I think it's our job, the job of people like you and the people like me, to create that vision that is unifying and that is positive and that 
allows people to have good quality housing and afford homes and good quality food. You know, we have to answer those questions. You know, we, I, I think we can't afford to be more realistic. You know, I don't consider myself to even be a fucking nice person, but I don't want this country to go to fucking tits. You know what I mean? I, I grew up here and it will get worse and it can get much worse. Um, but I think we need to be able to step out of our boxes and fucking build bridges and say, listen, maybe I don't agree with you on fucking everything, but I want my kids to have a fucking house to live in. And, um, you know, I don't go around pointing fingers. But one thing which I try to do in my book is not, not paint all the traders as villains because I don't think we get anywhere by saying, listen, you know, fuck it, fuck Jeremy Hunt, fuck Rishi Sunak. I never met him. This place is going to shit, let's fucking fix it. And we can decide who's, whose fault it was afterwards. Um, I think that's what we need to do. The issue is, and you said political change is coming, it just might not be good change. You know, the right, all the trends we're talking about here, you know, and, and I think it's really important to say this. Lots of places which from my entire life, your entire life have been lower middle class, the backbone of this country, the kids you went to secondary school with, both parents worked, maybe the mom was part time, lower middle income jobs. That house was 65 grand when I was 11 in Bournemouth. Now I think that's probably a seven or 800,000 pound house. It's probably an HMO, six people are living in it. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what's happened. We've turned the lower middle, we are turning the lower middle class um, away from prosperity, um, we're decimating the people below them. Like you say, they're, they're 500 pounds. They're a paycheck away from penury or mental health disaster. And I think that's obvious to lots of people, actually. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, I've said what hasn't changed. What has changed is people can't deny that. You know, like under Cameron Osborne, people say, oh, the good times will come back. It's just a few years, a bit of belt tightening. People now realize, no, this is, this is it. Now, the right would blame migration they'll blame the left they'll blame public spending actually the opposite's the case with regards to public spending they'll have lots of enemies now we can talk about migration we can sort of park that for a minute because the reality is if you have 1.3 million net immigration over two years and you're building 200,000 houses clearly you're not going to have enough supply we can we can park that for a moment but the point is the trends you have identified in the book what's driving inequality fundamentally is not migrants so how, when you're talking to people on a level, do you tell them that? Because it's so easy for certain people in politics to point at the bad guys. It's so obvious. Yeah. People have migrants in their communities. People know somebody who's a bit lazy or maybe has claimed benefits they shouldn't have. Or they know somebody who's left wing and a bit of a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites sometimes, yeah. but they've never met the people you've met. Yeah. They've never worked in Citibank in Canary Wharf and met... Caleb and all the other guys on that trading floor. So if they've not seen that, how can they understand it? First thing I will say is, I was, I, I was very actively thinking about this when I wrote the book in the sense that I think a lot of people who have watched my YouTube are probably going to think that the book is going to be kind of a kind of economic proselytizing, which some people might describe my YouTube as, pushing a very clear message. I don't express any economic opinions in the book other than trading opinions. What I wanted to do was, have you, have you read Candide by Voltaire? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's this book, right? Voltaire's, I don't know, some French guy from the 1700s, right? He, um, he wanted to criticize this idea that the world has to be this way. Otherwise, God wouldn't have made it this way. And what he does is, he just walks around showing you all the fucking terrible things that happen, all the terrible poverty, and just asks you, do you think this is the way, I, how the way it should be? You know, do you really think it's the way it should be? When I went into trading, I was not a political person. I was a competitive kid who didn't want to be poor, wanted to make some fucking money. And what I saw was an economy that was collapsing, and I started betting on that, and I started making a fucking ton of money on that. That politicised me. And... I never considered myself to be somebody on the left. Sometimes I still wonder whether I am, to be honest. It's going to shit. It's going to shit. Um, and I've fucking seen that and I've, I've been betting on it for fucking 10 years and I've been one of the best traders in the world betting on it and I've been to all the fucking top universities and um, I've been up there at the top of the mountain and there's a fucking tsunami coming. All I wanted to do is bring people up there and just show them what I saw. Show them what I saw and fucking kick the fucking morals out the window. I don't need to be the fucking nicest guy in the room, you know? I don't want it to go to shit. Um, but at the same time, there's a battle of ideas, right? Um, the right has a message, you know? There was, an art, there was a report on Sky News the other day which covered in the same, art, same piece um, 
immigrants housing crisis immigrants housing crisis and you know you said it yourself you know this many people come in this many houses very easy narrative to drive immigrants housing crisis they it's a clear message personally i think that this country and other countries in europe will become progressively more anti-immigrant over time i think you can see that trend happening there will be less immigration and it will not fix the housing crisis and that, that's not a moral message that is a prediction and you don't even wait you'll see i'm right <laughs> you'll see that i'm right give it 10 years that will happen more anti-immigration, fewer immigrants, housing will become less affordable, you know. You can go to places like fucking, you know, housing in fucking Mumbai and Shanghai is unaffordable, you know what I mean? Um, but it's a clear message. It's a clear message, right? When People fucking know that the boat's going down now. More and more people know that. When you know the boat's going down, you don't fucking go and compare the lifeboats, right? You get on the first fucking lifeboat, right? There is a clear message being delivered to ordinary people, which is we know things are shit. It's because of immigration. Reduce immigration and things will be better. It's not going to work. But people don't know that right now. People don't, so they're going to vote for it because they don't want things to keep getting worse. What's our, what's our offer? I'm saying the actual cause of this is growing wealth inequality. Wealth inequality is not just causing this. It's continuing to grow really quickly and accelerating rates so your life will get worse. This is a cancer in our economy, in your family. If you don't fix it, things will get worse, regardless of what the fuck you do to immigration policy. And I don't say that because I fucking love immigrants. I don't say that because I hate immigrants. I say that because I fucking bet on this every year and make a fucking ton of money and I believe it. But we need to win that battle of hearts and minds. Because I think, you know, the alternative is, some people come in with that more anti-immigrant policy. They push the policy a little bit that way. It doesn't get the results. They say it's because we didn't push it enough. Mm. And they push it more, you know, and... I find it very difficult to sit where we are now and not be reminded of the early 20th century. We can go that way. But we need to have a clear economic message. Our strength is, I believe this is correct. If you don't fix inequality, things will get worse. So their promises will be proved to be false in the sense that we will become more anti-immigrant and the problems won't be fixed. In fact, the problems will worsen. But we need to get that voice out there, which is, that is not the problem. And listen, we can have debates about immigration policy. You know what I mean? That is not the economic problem. It's not. It's not. And you, you, that will be proved true over time because we will become more anti-immigrant and the problem won't be fixed. So we need to be screaming, the problem is wealth inequality. And it's, people think that's some sort of lefty, nabby pamby liberal communist idea. This is why your kids can't get homes. This is why your kids are living in fucking poverty. This is why you can't pay the bills. This is why you can't feed your fucking kids. You know, we need to kick them. I personally think we need to kick them all out of the door, right? Because we need to build a coalition on this because I want people in this fucking country to be able to put the fucking heating on. And I think unless we fix inequality, then they're not going to be able to. Yeah, it's an ancillary point, but I think no, it's, it's fundamentally unimportant compared to what we've been talking about. But I think too often the left is, is, is obsessed with being viewed as nice or liberals as well, actually. You're obsessed with people thinking you're a good person. Like you say, I don't care. I mean, I'm a Christian. God can judge me. I don't care what you think of me. I want your kids to have an opportunity in life, like you say, to have a good home, nice quality of life. You only live once. I don't want your life to be shit. That's all I care about. And it's interesting you say about the right and the left. Like we had Philip Pilkington in recently, who is a macroeconomist. He's on the right, center right. He would say quite similar things to you on asset wealth and how it's driving all kinds of really negative things. And actually, the West, big W, is, is going down the toilet because of it. Um, so I think there's huge space there. Like you said, there is a big space for a political consensus on how to run the economy differently. What's really interesting, though, is, you know, the populist right have this really clear message about the things we just talked about. And I think on the left, there is, um, because that's been the case for 50, 60 years, a deference to liberals and the professions and academics, because our social base has been in academia. So if you've got academics and economics professors saying, yeah, it's bad, but you know, it's not that bad. We can do this, this, and this, and this. I feel like this formulation of the left and the center needs to go against the right completely misunderstands what's happening. Because it's not actually about, people don't work in these political blocks. Everyday people see there's a problem. So you have to identify there's a problem, identify solutions. The quote unquote center isn't doing that. They can't do that because they're beneficiaries of it. It's nothing personal. If you're a pundit or an economist, a thought leader in London, and you're a liberal, and you own a three million pound house, and it's tripled in value in the last 15 years, and you know, you've just spent 150 grand on a kitchen extension, 
you aren't going to think there's a problem with the world. And so fundamentally, like we have to rethink, reconsider what kinds of coalitions we have. And again, to big up a previous interview we did with Dan Evans, you know, he said precisely this. And it was a breakthrough when he explained this to me, the importance of the petty bourgeois, the small business owners, uh, the people who historically haven't really been part of quote unquote progressive coalitions. They're the people most smashed, being destroyed by all of this. And right now they're going right. And he has this great formulation with regards to Trump. Trump, Trumpism is about a fight between family capital and global capital. And, you know, you have small uh, family businesses across America. They're being smashed for lots of the reasons you're talking about. And they look at the major global multinationals, financial service industries on the coasts, doing super well. And for some reason, the left is saying, those people are idiots, racist, scumbags. We're going to line up with Jamie Dimon, Goldman Sachs, Hollywood. It's crazy. So quickly, because we talked a lot about economics. Mm -hmm. You made a political point there about coalition building. Yeah. This book is clearly a part of that. Mm. Um, I'd love it to be a film, by the way. We can talk about yeah. that more later on because there is a battle of ideas going on. With regards to economics professors yeah. and the people who are the problem and the people that the left has generally deferred to or lined up with, how do we, how do we change that? Where does, where does intellectual leadership come from then in, in, in building that kind of coalition if it's not coming from academics People in London with yeah. three million pound houses. It's hard, right? Because we've created this space where when it comes to economics, it's really clearly delineated who's allowed to have an opinion and who's not allowed to have an opinion. I went on Politics Live about a year ago, um, partially thanks to the publicity from our interview. Um, and at the time, and still now, I was obsessed with this enormous government deficit of the last few years and who's got it now. So it's 800 billion pounds now, the government deficit since the beginning of COVID, which is 16 grand per adult. And somebody has to have it. It's an accounting fact. And I was there sort of screaming out, who has this 800 billion pounds? Can you tell me? Can you tell me? And there were politicians there from every party. Well, at least there was Conservative and Labour. They looked at me and I knew immediately they didn't know who has the 800 billion pounds. They didn't know what the 800 billion pounds was. They didn't know they didn't know who had the 800 billion pounds. They didn't know they didn't know what the 800 billion pounds was. These guys are so clueless. They are beyond clueless. They are, they are so clueless that they are completely unable to recognize that they are clueless. So then you have this situation of, well, who the fuck do we listen to then? And it's difficult. And then this is why what you see, and I'm sure you know this as well as I, as, as well as I do, there's a lot of kind of crazy guys on the internet saying a lot of crazy stuff and people are listening to them because they're starting to realize the guys on the news have no fucking clue because their predictions are wrong every fucking year. So they start listening to a lot of stuff, which some of this stuff is, some of it's pretty terrible, you know, some of the stuff that they're listening to. Um, you know, I try as hard as I can on my YouTube channel to stay calm and to not lean into this kind of um, panicked, form of communication. Oh my God, everything's broken, everything's fucked, nothing's gonna be fixed. Listen, life is really, really getting hard now for ordinary families. Um, mental health is being really pushed because of that. Um, we need to provide a calm space that says clearly, listen, we understand what the problem is. The problem is growing wealth inequality. It's not gonna be easy to fix, but we can fix it. This, this is the clear message we need to push. And, you know, I, I try my best to speak to other economists on the left and say, let's push out this clear message. Um, I don't think I've succeeded in building a consensus on that. Um, listen, that is, I've got a YouTube channel which says the world's going to shit. And people message saying, you know, your channel gives me hope, which is kind of crazy, right? But the reason it does is because it says, listen, we can clearly define your problem. Once you understand the problem, we can work towards fixing it. Inequality has been reduced before. You can look at the situation after the Second World War. Inequality doesn't have to only go up. This is the problem. But I think, I think a massive problem that we will have is fighting against panic and fear. Because I see it in my friends. People are scared, man. People are scared and, and, and things are getting really, really bad. So I think 
people like you and I and the other people at Navarro have a platform, I think we have a responsibility to provide these guys with with the spaces. We know things are bad. We don't think things are going to get better. But we can explain this is the problem. Things can get better. If in, I honestly believe if enough people in this country, across Europe, across the world, come out and say, we're not going to accept forever rising inequality, then we can reduce it. Um, you know, we need to... There's this a quote, I think it's fucking Napoleon, which is, people don't get killed for a penny tuppence a day. You need to speak to their soul to electrify them. But, you know, there's so much fucking fast news and bullshit on the internet. We need to say, listen, it's going to be fucking hard. It's going to be fucking hard. You need to be there for your friends and for your family and for yourself. But you also need to step forward and say, we want to reduce inequality. And if enough people put their fucking hands up and demand it, eventually we can get it. But... I think we need to, as much as we can, provide communication that brings people to a space that feels calmer and, and feels where we can build something rather than just fucking kicking the shit out of each other all the time. Because I don't think we can build anything on that. Do you think Labour will change anything? We've got a Labour, potential Labour government coming in. Could be May, could be September, almost certainly September. Um, do you look at Rachel Reeves, Keir Starmer and think these guys, maybe not solve the problem, but they're going to push things in a slightly better direction? I don't think they're going to make... They are not going to stop inequality from increasing. They might slightly slow out the margins. I think if, if that's all you do, then you, the best you can hope for is a, is a slowdown in the rate of worsening of living standards, which is obviously not the most optimistic thing you can, you can ask for. I don't want to be here and sort of kick the shit out of the Labour Party. The truth is, look, there's centre-left political parties in power in many countries in the West, in many countries in the world. They're failing to improve living standards. Um, and they're unpopular because they're failing. And they're also centre-right parties, including in our, in our country, who are in power and are failing to reduce living standards. Um, I, I don't think we gain anything from political factionalism. And, you know, but it's not factionalism. It's about, because yeah. a lot of people, when, when, if and when the Conservatives lose, there'll be lots of hope. Yeah. And, and my experience of the last 15 years is there's nothing worse than a disappointed yeah. optimist. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think we're going to have lots of disappointed optimists because... My view is that Labour, like you say, they don't even understand the problem, let alone the solutions. You know, they have a, they have this informal board they've convened in regards to how we're going to do infrastructure spending and build the infrastructure we need for the 21st century. And one of the people involved in that is an asset management firm. Asset managers are the problem. Like, they're a reason why infrastructure doesn't work. Macquarie buy Thames Water. They do exactly what you talk about with trade. They buy low. They don't invest. They increase the bills. They sell high. That's what they do. That's that's why they exist. But, yeah. but Labour don't seem to understand that. So uh, my worry is, Gary, we've talked about the issues of, you know, the, the right have the easy answer. You have a Labour government that comes in. They don't even know the problem. And I think, you know, it's important to be realistic about them. Yeah. Probably not doing very much. But no, if, Or could they? Maybe there'll no, be a, a light there that... I don't disagree. Listen, I, I am very worried. Right? Labour will almost certainly win the next election. Um, I think under them, living standards will get worse. I think that that has a very real possibility of ushering fascism into the country. And I don't think this is unique to the UK. I'm very worried and I don't think they'll fix things. Um, what do we do? What do we do? You know, we have to fucking build it. We have to create that alternative. Listen, listen. I get contacted by Labour MPs sometimes. They're not all dickheads, right? Some of them are nice guys, right? I don't know any of them very, very well, but I presume. Um, and to be honest, I don't give them a lot of time. You know why I don't give them a lot of time? Because right now, I'm not going to change their policy. What I want is fucking, fucking millions of subs on YouTube, right? And then fucking I'll talk to them when they fucking have to listen to me. You know, the reality of the situation from a power perspective, the guys who are supposed to fix this will not fix this. They will not fucking fix this. So fucking we have to fix this. You and me and the people listening and the people in this country, the people who fucking hate you, the people who fucking hate me, we have to fix it because they're not going to fix it. So we need to build, we need to build it ourselves. And, you know, I'm trying to build power for me. Some people won't like me to say that. I, I'm trying to fucking get fucking power for me. I'm trying to get people in this country who listen to what I say and you ask me, Gary, who should we vote for? Should we support the Labour Party? So that I can turn around to them and say, you don't fucking do this. I'm fucking taking you down. I'm, I'm fucking trying to build it. I'm trying to build it. Um, you know, there are some guys in there who, they're not going to make it better. So who's going to make it better? Are we going to make it better?
You said earlier about how um, nothing was the same after you got that first bonus. And it seems to me that the core insight you had, which allowed you to make so much money, which was that things would get worse forever, that interest rates would be lower than inflation. We'd have near zero interest rates for, you know, that's part of 15 years. Um, that insight made you a ton of money. But if you don't mind me saying it, also probably had a massive overhead with regards to your mental health. Yeah. Because you, big, big you, thing in the book. Yeah. You recognized something which, yeah, okay, helped your bank balance, but you realized was shafting the country, but also, you know, much of the developed world. How, how has that played out with you personally? Because we spoke before, you didn't really talk about the mental health stuff, yeah. but then it really is center stage in the book. Yeah, no, I wanted that to be a big part of the book. Um, it was crazy, right? Because I made a ton of money, right? You know, anyone who comes from where I'm, where, where I'm from grows up like how I did. They want to make a ton of money. And you think if I make a ton of money, life's going to be fucking fantastic, right? You think that. And I thought that. And um, I made a ton of money. And um, you know, people are going to go out and read the book. I didn't really enjoy it. That's probably a pretty strong understatement. You know, my mental health, you could say I had the breakdown. You could, you could and that's, that's no fucking secret. It's in the book. Go out and read the book. You know, that money separated me from my family, from my friends. It revealed to me massive fucking problems about the society that we live in. Massive fucking problems about the future, which I couldn't speak to anyone about. Um, and like a lot of people, I responded, especially for the first couple of years, well, well, I'll just fucking make more, which is like typical, right? It's in a sense, it's typical addiction, you know. You know, we, we talk about addiction in terms of drugs and gambling, but money and work are definitely addictions. Um, and I let into it and I did more and more. And I I wasn't raised as a person thinking like, what's your obligation to society? And, you know, betting on whether the economy would be strong or weak, it was my fucking job. You know what I mean? If your job is fucking delivering sofas, you don't deliver a sofa and say, is that good for society? You know what I mean? It's my fucking job, so I did it. Um, but then of course, over time, these like questions start to start to sort of creep into your mind. And there's one conversation, maybe about three quarters of the way through the book, which is the first time we sort of explicitly mention it. Which I speak to this sort of young Australian trader from a very wealthy background and I say to him, do you, do you think we should do something? And he's like, what do, you, what do you mean? I was like, you know, about the fucking economies going to shit. Like, do you think we should do something? And he's like, well, we, we put that trade on. And I'm like, but you laugh, but that's our job, right? And then I say- What else is he going to say? I yeah. turn around to him and say, no, I'm not talking about the fucking trade. Like, do you think we should do something? And he, he doesn't understand. He's like, what do you mean? And, I, and I'm like, do you think we should fucking do something? Do you think we should fucking do something? And you need to understand the way the world works, all right? There's economists in government. There's economists in the civil service. There's economists in the universities. There's economists in the media. The best paid 10,000 economists in the world are all fucking traders and you never fucking hear a word from them. All right, that's the way the world works, all right? I work for Citibank. I get paid a million pounds a year. I manage their fucking money betting on European interest rates. You're in the media. You want to know about European interest rates. You call Citibank up. Do they fucking put you on the phone to me? Of course they fucking don't. All right? There's one world of people who run the economy and they're the fucking national conference, mate. They're the fucking third division. All of the best paid economists in the world are traders and you never fucking hear them. This is the way the world works. Right? This is the way that it is built. Is it any surprise the economy is going to shit? You know, and you, you see this horror open up in front of you, which is the obviousness of the collapse of society. And what the fuck do you do? And I, like everyone, shut it up. I said, fuck it, ignore it. I'm fucking making money, fuck it, ignore it. But it was sort of funny, like, it would be easy for me to sit here and say, I realized it was wrong and I walked away. The truth is I got fucking sick. I got sicker and sicker and sicker. It was like my body said no. And I stopped fucking, I stopped fucking sleeping. I stopped fucking eating. I stopped fucking washing. I bought a flat. I tore everything out. I put a fucking mattress on the floor, a TV on the floor and the concrete fucking floor. And I lived like that. And I was, I made fucking 2 million pounds the previous year. And it's, I think we live in a society 
that almost tells you, and I, I thought I was raised with this idea, your, your moral imperative as an individual is to make money for yourself and for your family. And I thought that that was right, but something inside me said it fucking wasn't right. And I think the fact is like, I think we've been, we've been sort of told as humans, you have to choose between yourself and others. Um, you know, I get people on my fucking YouTube, why don't you give all your fucking money away then? Like the only way you have a moral right to help other people is to totally destroy your fucking life. And listen, I've thought about these things a fucking lot. And the way I see it is, I think that me as an individual, I think I have enough space in my fucking heart for both me and for fucking others. And if enough of us can fucking do that and fucking stop fucking worrying about, listen, I know there's a ton of people that have got no fucking time and space. Go out and make the money you can for your families. But there are people in this country and in the world who have space to help us with this project and are not helping us. And um, we need to fucking, you know, we've been told there's no such thing as society, right? People fucking message me and they say, why the fuck do you care? You're rich, why the fuck do you care? As if my fucking family don't live in this fucking world. As if everyone I grew up with doesn't live in this fucking world. As if I don't give a fuck if everyone I've ever met fucking falls into poverty. Listen, people fucking matter. You know, it's not fucking complicated. And in a sense, this, this book is sort of my journey of discovering that. Because I wasn't raised being told that. And um, I'm hoping that's a positive message for people who read the book. And also the people that come after us. Like, we have... You know, life is better now than it was several centuries ago because people made certain choices. They built certain things, they discovered certain things, they decided to allocate resources in a certain way. And the decisions we're making mean that people that come 50, 100 years after us, whether it's inequality, whether it's climate change, whether it's failing to just build stuff, is that, like you say, they're going to inherit a country which looks more like South Africa or India than the one we inherited. There's no Christian of South Africa or India, it's just, you know, it's fundamentally different. And to think that those people don't matter because, I don't know, you want to live the life of Riley and put on Instagram for a few years is, it's vacuous, it's morally dubious, but it's also just like, so what do you believe in? Like, what do you want? And this goes to a separate question. We don't talk about it enough in, in, in politics, but also in Navarra media, is that I do feel that a capitalist secular society, and I, I, I think secular societies are good, but I feel like a secular society where you do tell people all that matters is money, all that matters is profit. Um, the only reason why you should do something is if it makes money. Why, why have you pursued that course of action or that course of action? Because it made up higher revenues. I feel like that is the recipe for the road to hell. That is how you destroy a society. Yeah. And that's not a, a left, I don't think even there's a left wing thing. I think a conservative can say that. Of yeah. course, a conservative would say that's why we need the restoration of religious values and whatnot. But clearly, when you have a society, a secular society, where the thing that matters most is, I'm going to get some bread, fuck the rest of you, where do you think you end up? Yeah. There's this kind of, like, beautiful and horrible irony, I think, which is that, listen, power exists. Power exists. Some people have more power than others, all right? And in this world we live in now, and to be honest, for most of history, there have been a small number of people with phenomenal amounts of power. And they're not always evil, but when you have an enormous amount of power, it becomes quite easy to, to take power. And in, in our modern society, that often means wealth from poorer people and less powerful people. And that is, that is what is happening, right? If you, look, if you look generationally, you can see that middle family is losing wealth, the government is losing wealth, the rich are accumulating wealth. And um, you know, this is why most of history has been phenomenally unequal because it's relatively easy for the powerful to dispossess the powerless. And the only defense that poor and ordinary people have from very, very rich, very powerful people is that there's a fucking lot of them, right? And, and the only way that they use that defense is by working together. So you have this kind of, this beautiful and horrible irony, which is if you can convince poor people and ordinary people to be very, very selfish in a material sense, you will completely materially impoverish them. So this is amazing irony that if you can make poor people obsessed with getting rich and they will become poor. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing. And I think there's a kind of, you know, this is the society we live in. You know, we, it's, you know, it's easier for every individual to be like, fuck it. You know, I've got a YouTube channel that's out there that, that says every fucking week, listen, things are going to shit. 
we can fix it. We need to work together to reduce wealth inequality. The number one most common message I receive by a fucking mile is, can you tell me how to make money? Um, and I, I'm not criticizing that because, you know, if you ask 15 year old me, you would have said the same fucking thing because I grew up in this society and it's hard being poor and I don't judge people. If we can't convince enough poor and ordinary people to, to share that instinct with, and also let's work together to help each other, then, then they're going to be fucked, aren't they? So in a sense, you know, I don't consider myself a super moral person or a religious person. I was raised going to religion, going like to church, but it's kind of a moral test for our society. Are you willing to put your selfishness aside enough to protect your selfish interests? Um, and I hope that we can. I believe that we can. I know that I was raised to be selfish and I was a very selfish person when I was younger. And I, I don't think I'm completely unselfish now. I still am a selfish person in many ways, right? But I, I believe in the people of this country that they, they can work together as well and they can see the importance of that. The point you make about you know, feudalism um, and income inequality over past centuries, it's something I've been thinking about a lot because we talked with Yanis Varoufakis not long ago about his new book, Techno Feudalism, or newish book now. And one of the core differences is, and this is fascinating for me, is that of course aristocracy feudalism was very bad. Of course it was. But aristocrats in you know, 13th, 14th, 15th century, they viewed themselves as custodians of future generations. Obviously not the mass of society, but for their class fundamentally, their families, their class. Um, and this is actually borne out in things like, for instance, wilderness uh, in this country, the most biodiverse parts of the UK, uh, are bits of land which have been held by the same family for centuries. It's not been developed, it's not been built on. So you get really rare species of tree, animal, in actually parts of land which weren't commodified in a way that we understand it. And techno-feudalism, neo-feudalism, has all of those traits of feudalism, but it hasn't got sucker for working people, because at least with feudalism, they're told they go to heaven after this, right? Mm -hmm. There isn't even that. There's no brides tomorrow. And you have a, an elite who don't believe actually in making the future better than the past, which is kind of operating up until now, which is a terrifying thing, you know. And I know you can be given, you can give, we can all create these sort of mental maps for ourselves and be prone to hyperbole, but it does feel like the worst possible way to construct society. And then the point you made a few minutes ago, Gary, about the media and the best traders in the world, best economists in the world being traders. Yeah. Amazing insight. So presumably then people should just ignore economic analysis on the TV because these people are, they're not, they're not even playing the same game. They're not even on the same pitch. Yeah, I think, I said that last time I came on, right? It's entertainment. Economic analysis on the TV is an entertainment product. Um, the thing is, there probably are some good economists like working for media stations, but how the fuck do they get on the front lines? You know, I, I turned up in Citibank, fucking... Little kid from Ilford, right? Don't fucking know no one. Within two, three years, this is the fucking guy. The money goes to him. He makes the bets. He has the call. He calls the shots. He's the fucking guy because I was betting it right. You know what I mean? There's no way for me to do that in a place like the media. You know, I came out. I've got fucking article, articles out March, April 2020 saying we're going to go into a massive inequality, cost of living inflation crisis. A video, June 2020, right? I could get paid fucking two million pound a year for making these bets. I'm putting it on YouTube for fucking free. And you know, okay, we've got more than 100,000 subs now, it's growing, you know, we love the support we get, but like the media does not have mechanisms for getting the best people and saying, this is the guy who's always right, by the way. So maybe listen to him, you know? So I think the truth is, no, I mean, honestly, maybe this sounds arrogant. I think the best fucking economic analysis you can get is my fucking YouTube channel. Because, it, listen, how much money have I given up to run that YouTube channel? 10 million pounds? You, you should not be able to access that. You, you cannot afford my YouTube channel. Like, you can't. I, I'll get paid 2 million pounds a year to not tell you this stuff. And I'm telling you for free. You know, th there's a reason why you don't get good analysis. Because people who have good analysis get paid fucking lots of money not to tell you. So, you know, that sounds like a massive pitch on my YouTube channel, doesn't it? But it's true. It's fucking true. Look, you know, look at me, right? Do you think kids like me get paid a million pounds a year for chatting shit? No, we fucking don't, right? Like, I, I fucking made this money because I'm fucking good at it. And if you don't believe it, go and look at the fucking predictions. Yeah, that's the analysis, mate.
the the incentives thing is really interesting because you know you're saying that you make lots of money or traders make lots of money not just when they're right cause it's easy lots of people can be right about stuff all the time when you're right and other people are wrong ideally when everyone's wrong then you can make a ton of money there's no real incentives in the media mm. to be right when everybody else is wrong you know like it, actually it's the com the incentives in media work in the complete opposite direction yeah, yeah everybody's saying this one thing i have to say this because then i'll look stupid yeah like yeah, yeah. corbyn had a 2017 you know i was an outsider so i was saying i think hung parliament's pretty quite likely actually who's this fucking weirdo or somebody that says Oh, actually, Trump, 2016, he's going to win. Who the fuck is that? Huff Huffington Post giving him like 3% likelihood of winning on election day. Yeah. Or Brexit. And look, I say it in Navarro Media, we're, we're prone to it. It's a, cognitive, it's a human bias. It's a cognitive bias. If 99 people out of 100 say something, the 100th person will agree with them. That's yeah, yeah. human nature. What you have in trading is a massive incentive, i.e. making a shit ton of money, yeah. to say to those 99 people, actually, you're all wrong. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to be brave enough to say it because if I'm right, I'm going to be a multimillionaire. That doesn't exist in the media. Yeah. But you, you know, the way media works is there's an extremely strong incentive to just chat some shit mainstream opinion when you don't know what you're talking about. Listen, you and I, we go on news stations, right? I consider myself a real expert on economics, right? I don't do it much nowadays, but I used to do a lot, right? You go on some TV show, you know, best fucking trader in the world, million dollar trader. And they say, what do you think about? Asylum seekers. And <laughs> what I want to say is, I don't fucking know fucking anything about asylum seekers because I'm a fucking economist, mate, right? But you can't say that. You're not allowed to be like, well, actually, I've got no opinion on that because I'm not an expert on that. You fucking have to say, well, blah, blah, blah. What are you going to do? You're going to say what you read in the fucking Guardian yesterday because you don't fucking know anything about that. You know what I mean? And it's such, I only did two of these news reviews because I realized this is such fucking comedy. It's absolute fucking comedy, isn't it? You know, like you've got this guy, one of the, you know, one of the best paid traders in the whole fucking world in the middle of a cost of living crisis and you're asking him what he thinks about Prince fucking William. You know, this is a fucking joke, right? It, it's fucking comedy, right? It's crazy, yeah. As a trader, I put on one bet a fucking year, mate. And when people ask, when I was working as a trader, right, there's a, there's a line in the book from one of my favourite characters, JB, Australian trainer, which is, opinions are like arseholes. Everyone's got one, all right? When I was a trader, I don't want to know your fucking opinion. I want to know your fucking position. What are your fucking bets? What are you betting on right fucking now? And if you're not fucking betting on it, don't fucking talk to me about it. The way I see it, you know, I was getting called up to a lot of fucking Bitcoin shit, right? And I, I think Bitcoin's bullshit. And I was just saying that and people were like giving me shit. And I thought, you know what? I shouldn't be saying this if I don't have no fucking money on it. So I opened up an account and I bet on Bitcoin falling. And I think if you made every fucking guy on the news do that, we'd get a lot fucking less bullshit opinions. You know, if I'm wrong, I'm losing fucking money. You know what I mean? And to be honest, I think like one small thing that we could do that would really improve like media is like force these guys to force academics to make predictions, force media economists to make predictions and then go back and see who was fucking right. Especially in the ones that were like super like unexpected opinions. Um, you know, you've got to start punishing people. You know, you've got to. I think you have to. We need betting markets on daytime TV. So, you know, the person comes up, well, they're up a thousand pounds this year. They must know what they're talking about. But like you say, it's almost like it's you're, you're consciously trying to create a low information environment. Now, of course, people watch the news to be informed. People watch 24-hour news to, you know, I want to be on top of the news. But like you say, nine times, not all the time, because sometimes Gary Stevenson will be on to talk about, um, you know. Prince uh, William. <laughs> yeah. U.S. Treasuries and, you know, what's going to, you know, U.K. gilts and interest rates. And what does that mean for your mortgage? Great. High value. Perfect guy to ask. But nine times out of ten, it's not that. Um, and like you say, it's a kind of a genre of entertainment. And it is interesting that like people are told now, I mean, I think generally people are better informed than ever. That's not, but that's not because of legacy media. Like it is not, it's because they go to your YouTube channel or they come to our YouTube channel or, you know, they search out for interesting people who say interesting things on Twitter or Instagram or TikTok. Um, but legacy media is the last place you should look for high value information. Separate point, but I find it fascinating. Speaking of high value information, mm -hmm. We've talked about your book. We've talked about a bunch of really interesting stuff. I want you to make a prediction. Okay. Um, your bet, which made you super wealthy, was that we'd have basically 0% interest rates for a long time. We did. Inflation goes up. We can talk about why that happens. There's a lot of dissent out there. Um, but it went up. Yeah. Interest rates go up. They're now coming back down again. The question is how quickly. Where are they going to be by, say, the midpoint of this year and the end of this year, both for the US and the UK, because of course this, this has implications electorally. Yeah. Okay, you got a mortgage rolling over probably. It's no, 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 a couple of years um, time. In inflation will come down quite a lot. Um, we're talking end of Jan, will this run sort of Feb? 
I reckon in the next six months, so by sort of, by July, August, I think inflation will be quite a lot lower than it is now. You know, this kind of stuff is surprisingly easy to predict. I'm shoot, probably shoot myself in the foot here. Because you can, people don't think about it, but the changes in the yearly inflation rate are massively affected by just what inflation was exactly one year ago. So you can see the inflation from one year ago dropping out. We had a lot of inflation the first half of last year, which will drop out of the numbers. Um, inflation will come down. There's a question of whether it will come down to target. Um, which is 2%. Yeah, target's 2%. I'm not sure, to be honest, whether it will. Um, market reckons that base rate in this country will come down to about, I think, last time I checked it, it was just over 4%. So now it's five and a quarter. It will come down to sort of four. I think short-term predictions are hard to make. I think medium-term... My only concern is, right, so I, I'm, I've been a bit of an outlier on this in the last few years because I said that the, the COVID deficit, which was massive, will be inflationary. It may be quite unpopular with some economists on the left. Um, and even now they will say, yeah, it was unrelated. The deficit was unrelated. I think if you run massive government deficits, it does make inflation high. And the, the deficits during COVID are enormous. But what you have now is a situation where poverty is just massively higher than it was three years ago. Um, and that means that the demands on government services are way more because people are fucking, they need like in desperate need, basically, which means government has to run higher deficits, basically permanently, which is obviously not a great situation. That could lead to higher medium term inflation levels. Um, I think my base case, most likely scenario is that both inflation and interest rates come down quite a lot over the next couple of years. The only reason I'm not certain is because I'm not sure what the long term effect of these permanently high deficits will be. The big bet I've got on right now is that really regardless of whether interest rates come down or not, I think asset prices will increase really significantly. And that is because economists still generally don't account for the fact that governments across the world here and in the US and everywhere else basically gave a shit ton of money out during COVID. And I think people and even economists conceptualize this money given out by the government as like, like burned wood. You give the money out and it's just disappeared. We had to give that money out to support the economy like you're burning a like a log to keep your house warm. That's not how money works, right? When you give money out, somebody keeps it, they probably don't fucking burn it, right? So that amount of money is still swishing around, right? It's fucking 18, 16 grand per person in this country, 80 grand per US taxpayer. I think the rich have got that. I mean, fucking anyone out there who's sitting on 16 grand can put in the fucking comments, but I think the rich have got that money, right? Um, at the moment, they're, they're happy to take their 5% from the government on it. But even if rates don't come down, they've got, the rich have got so much fucking money now. They have to do something with it. They can't just sit on it. And I think if rates do come down, which I think they will, I think in the next sort of three, four years, what ordinary people will see is the mother of all house price rallies, especially if interest rates come down. But you'll also see it in stock markets. I'm unbelievably long gold. Um, I think what you'll see is asset prices going up. And I think this is my big confidence. Like I said, I don't want to know your opinions. I want to know your positions. I'm betting on asset prices going up. I'm very long gold. I'm building a long position in stocks. I'm building a long position in commodities. I'm long property. Like this is what I think will, will happen. Um, but it's really interesting to sit and think, what will it mean for our society and for our political situation if house prices go up loads? I think it's going to be unbelievably divisive because you know I know you have a lot of younger viewers that straight away, this is fucking terrible. But there's a lot of people in this country that think house prices going up is good. And I think that this is what we need to prepare ourselves for. I think I, think I saw a statistic. And this is from 2019. It's probably worse now. One in six baby boomers is a millionaire, right? Um, and and the, that is, if you want to talk about the people that do the door knocking for the Conservative Party, that, you know, they will vote in every single bloody election for the Tories and think the sun shines out of Jeremy Hunt's backside, even when they're as terrible as they are right now. You look at the polls and who are these 25% of people? It's those people and the people sort of immediately around them. And we know that from the sort of broader voter breakdown, actually, by age and um, income. And I think that's right. Um, you did a video on this recently about you, you think that we're going to see a big upturn in, in house prices. I mean, 18 months ago, people were talking about a 15, 20% fall potentially 15 percent fall in house prices realistically it's not happened we've seen maybe five percent but we're still well above where we were in 2020 you know there was this huge market rally with regards to house prices from you know early 2020 all the way through to what maybe mid 2021 it's fallen slightly but you're still massively up and that's like with you say mortgage rates which were actually comparable to the size of loans that people were taking out to buy houses that was actually quite analogous to the situation in the early 1990s. So there was this massive shock, which should have meant 
a massive fall in house prices. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. And like you say, if interest rates just go back to 3%, maybe even 4%, it's hard not to see more increases in house prices. Uh, you said you're long on gold, you're long on stocks, which is almost hard to believe. You know, we're seeing sort of, how 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 high can the FTSE go then? I mean, what's the, is that? There's no ceiling here, presumably. Yeah, there was this, there was an economist at Citibank before my time who wrote a piece. This is in the early 2000s. Oh, it was called like the Great Divergence or something. And it, I'm saying he, it might've been a woman. I don't know the name, right? But this, this economist, they, um, they wrote a piece saying the future of the economy is going to be determined by growing inequality, which means that don't buy stocks that sell to ordinary people because the ordinary person's fucked. Buy stocks that sell either super luxury or like super basic because that's the future of the economy. And this caused a massive fraud and this economist got fired, which I think is like quite hilarious. If a trader did that, they'd never get fired. They'd be fucking getting paid a fortune. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, stocks that sell to the middle will struggle. But, you know, as a trader... I'm always looking for what are people missing? What are people missing? The big thing which people are missing is the, the question I asked on fucking politics live. Where's that? At the time it was 650. Now it's 800 billion. Where is that? I think it was 750. Now it's 800. Where is the 800 billion? People haven't realized that these massive government deficits, if I, if I come into this room and give out a thousand pounds, right? When I leave the room, someone's going to have a fucking thousand pounds, right? That's what people haven't realized. People haven't realized that those massive government deficits lead to massive, massive accumulation of cash in rich people's bank accounts. And rich people are so fucking cashed up right now compared to where they were three years ago, massively. And also like, how can they get rid of it? You know, they can't uncash themselves. You know, like if I give him money, he's got it. If he gives it, you, you've got it. They can't get rid of it. You know, they're going to use this money to buy the assets from the middle class, which means that the middle class won't have houses, which means they'll pay more rent which means it goes back to the fucking rich, right? So I think this is the, the big thing, which people talk about the government debt and, the go, you know, government debt can cause problems. We all saw trustonomics, right? Definitely it can. But what nobody talks about is who's on the other side of that debt? If the government debt is exploding, then somebody's wealth is exploding. Somebody is sitting on a fuck ton of cash and bonds, right? Sitting on it. And they're not going to sit on it. They're going to want to divert. At the moment, they're getting 5%. As soon as that comes down 4%, 3%, they're going. And, and that's people, when they go into housing and stocks. And yeah, into housing, stocks. And, you know, certain stocks would do badly. I think that sort of middle of the road stocks would do badly because the middle of the road person would do badly. But, you know, I think one thing that is interesting people don't think about is over time, what you will see is the physical infrastructure of our country will start to transform to reflect the change in the wealth distribution. Yeah. And you see it. You know, I spoke about in Ilford where I grew up. You know, that was always like this, well, probably more like working class families. But now it's, it's poverty. It's poverty. And that's, you know, now I live in sort of zone two and you see the luxury. You know what I mean? But what you see in is, you know, if you go to Colombia or really, to be honest, any Latin American country, what you see is mega cities with a tiny fucking Zona Rosa, right? Like wealthy area surrounded by poverty. That is the physical manifestation of an unequal society. And, and your country needs to reflect your society. We have moved away from a post-war middle-class society and we are moving into kind of what there is in the third world, which is a super unequal society. That is why the country needs to change, you know, and, and you'll see the same in, in the stock market, which is middle of the road companies will do badly and luxury will continue to do super well. I want to big up another interview we did, which was with Brett Christophers, which was on asset managers. Um, and it's exactly the thing you're talking about here where they have loads of money. Where do we put it? Um, particularly salient when, like you say, gilts go down. Okay, well, we make less money from uh, UK government debt. Let's look elsewhere for returns. And the FT in the last week, Financial Times in the last week, has had so many stories about asset managers having more money than ever to spend. We, ha we have nowhere to invest money. We have so much money. We don't know where to put it. Well, I'll tell you where the money's going to go. It's going to go into quote unquote real assets. It's going to go into housing. It's going to go into waste management services. It's going to go into water companies. It's going to go into all the basic services you need to run a country. That's where it's going. That's where it's been going. That's where it's going to continue going. More and more and more and more. And to get those returns, what do they have to do? Buy low, squeeze the bills, increase the bills, don't invest, sell high. One other big thing they can do is they can dispossess government. Because who is it who really needs money right now? Governments that are sitting on explosions in poverty. They really fucking need money. So the rich have got a fucking ton of money. 
in some, they're still holding on to some legacy assets, you know, from the welfare state. The government fucking need money, you know. That power dynamic is not good, right? So I think there's, you know, a strong incentive towards basically, you know, more privatization of government assets because that's the dynamic, you know. These guys have all the money. Those guys fucking need the money. These guys want assets. They've still got some assets, you know. They're going to fucking lose, aren't they? Even building like nuclear power stations, you know, the government now, we're going to build size well, see whatever that's called. You know, it's going to be 25 billion, but the government thinks it can only spend four or five billion. Actually, asset management can come in and, 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 and pay the rest. What do you think they're doing it for? They're not doing it for the goodness of their heart. They're doing it to make money. And they're not interested in long-term investment in terms of maintenance or whatever. They want to get out really quickly. Lots of these assets, asset management funds, asset managed funds, they are not thinking of a timeline 50, 100 years. They're thinking, they literally, they're closed funds. They stop operating after 10 years, right? Many of them, most of them. Nuclear power station, nuclear waste, you have to think, in, you do have to literally think in a time frame of thousands of years with nuclear waste. And it's just such a mad way to run society. So I think that's why your story in this book, an amazing personal story, of course, Gary, but the story you're telling about the economy, it runs right through asset management. It runs right through the, the Yanis's, um, Yanis Varoufakis's kind of hypothesis. It runs right through what Dan Evans spoke to me about with regards to the decimation of the, of the middle class and, and the ensuing politics. A brilliant book. You said, I won't say their name, you said somebody quite prestigious said it was their book of 2024 we're only in january yeah am i allowed to mention his name or you can i don't yeah. know it's um, up to you yeah roy stewart has put out as his book of 2024 we didn't pay him to say that he just come out and say it. everybody's sending me messages oh roy stewart's big job book up um we had irvin welsh um train spotting authors giving it a good review um look i think it's a fucking good book i put my heart you've read it you know you can say great, your opinion great um, great book great book it's going to be a movie right yeah we, we've we've sold the options to it so we'll see if they you know they have to sort of get it made but um I I'm, think, I'm, I'm just saying that. Is that I think well, whoever's bought it, yeah. it's going to be a movie. It's going yeah, to be I a think very good movie. People will be surprised when they read this book. This is not, this is not a book about trade and about economics. Those are in there, but this is a, this is a personal story. It's got good characters. It's got a good drive in it. Um, sometimes I don't really know where it comes from, to be honest, because I've never really written sort of any sort of novelistic work before. But um, there's good emotion in it, and um, it's a massive opportunity for me to spread awareness of the, these problems, you know. I think it's, the YouTube is there for people who wanna know the economics, but this for me is a chance to really kick the door down and have a discussion with people who wouldn't be looking at the channel. And really for me, I, I think it's a call to arms, but in very much through the, through the means of telling a story. And um, I hope it works because, you know, you, you know as well as I do, my predictions are not positive for the future and I, and I want to make this conversation happen. And um, yeah, I hope people, you know, I hope people go out and buy it because it will give us a massive chance to, to have this debate. Imagine goodwill hunting and uh, the broader story is actually one that is salient for the entirety of society. Gary, promise me one thing. All right, what's that? Don't let Guy Ritchie make the film. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to. I can just see it. A wide boy, you know, Jason Statham playing one of the major traders that you work alongside. Uh, but seriously, it's a great story. I think it will make a fantastic film. Um, and rarely, it's going to have massive political consequences, I hope for the better. So thank you for writing it and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me.